Good morning, everybody. Good to have everybody with us this morning. We'll uh, take a minute here just to get everybody in and then we'll begin. Thanks a lot. We really appreciate you having us. Well, good to, good to have everybody with us. We've got uh, several folks on, so thanks a lot for joining uh, this morning as we uh, present this webinar, Future Trends in Cybersecurity. Uh, my name is Tavis Patterson. I'm the president of TAS Networks and uh, welcome you today. Uh, a brief overview of TAS Networks. Uh, some of you on the call are our clients, others not, but uh, we do IT support. Uh, for businesses, we're a managed service provider. We're located here in Southeast Michigan. We have offices uh, in Brighton and Clinton Township. And so we uh, are using ConnectWise as a vendor partner, and that's who's presenting for us today. Uh, Natalie is with us, and she's going to take care of presenting the majority of the time for us today. But uh, Natalie, thanks a lot for joining us from ConnectWise today. We really appreciate having you. Uh, take it away. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So just a little bit of background on me. I did start as a software developer when I began my career. So I am technical and that and the most important stuff is I'm passionate about threat intelligence, my family and Lego. And those are the most important things on my resume there. So welcome everyone. So I'm going to talk to you today about cybersecurity and some of the things that we're seeing happen and we believe are going to continue to happen in the threat landscape. And uh, we're going to address that. And you guys can go ahead and ask questions because we'd like this to be interactive. We do have a Q&A um, section. So if you could pop that out and just feel free to ask questions and I will answer as we go along. And if I miss something, Aubrey's going to be my buddy here and let me know I missed something. So we will make sure we address anything, any concerns you have. So um, just my agenda so you know what's coming up. We're going to talk a little bit about what is this mysterious thing called cybersecurity? Why is a small to medium-sized business should this concern me? <clears throat> I want to show you an attack that we're seeing happen currently. We'll talk a little bit about people, process, and tech. We're going to talk about risk and responsibility. Excuse me, and then we're going to drive it all home with a cybersecurity analogy so you can remember the things that you've learned today. So, what, um, how has time changed? Well, you know, it used to be we didn't get in strangers' cars. Um, most of us certainly didn't meet people from the internet, right? And now we take this little computer right here which is more powerful than the computers that I had back in the 80s and 90s. And we literally summon strangers from the internet and we get in their car. And most of the time, nothing bad happens, right? So with that, that's just a little example of how much time has changed and things have changed in cybersecurity as well. So, what is this mysterious cybersecurity thing? Um, has anyone on the call heard of Gartner? Uh, you can use the Q&A to engage with me. Um, so if you want to answer questions I ask or ask questions of your own, we can use that for that. And it is anonymous. You do have the option of posting anonymous. Has everyone heard of Gartner? Well, uh, usually I get about 50-50 on that. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you they're kind of like a think tank. So they like to make up technical definitions. I mean, they do a little bit more than that. They do a lot of studies. They'll study different types of software um, <clears throat> and tell you what the best type is. But one of the things they did is they actually defined this mysterious term that we call cybersecurity. And this is their definition. 
So if you wanted to take a moment and look at that. And I do think Gartner got part of it right. It really is about technology and processes and practices, but really it's a little more, especially to a business owner, right? So what I think it's about is it's really about managing your risk, right? Um, security is a cost is most likely a cost center for you. Um, for me, it's my job. It's what I live and breathe, right? Um, but for you as a small business, you probably have some competing priorities. Um, and cybersecurity may not be at the top unless you're thinking of it in the right terms. And I, by the right terms, I mean as as in risk, risk to your business. And so security really only makes sense where it can mitigate risk and it reduces um, your business risk to save you money. So what are the, some of those concerns you might have as a small to medium sized business or SMB just to be uh, succinct? Cybersecurity confusion. Um, most people don't realize cybersecurity is not an IT challenge. It's a business challenge. Of course, there's an IT component to it, but it truly is a business challenge uh, all around risk. You may have some difficulty with competing priorities. You may be in business to provide healthcare services or financial services or to build a certain product or, but you're not in the job, you're not in the career of doing cybersecurity, right? Like me. So you may have other things that are more important to you than cybersecurity, and you really would like to just make sure you're managing your risk and not really thinking about that, right? Remote workforce. I mean, due to COVID, a lot of us have gone to fully remote, right? Or now maybe hybrid remote. Maybe you have a lot more people working out in the field now than you used to. Or maybe you provide a service like a, a like a utility or something where you are in the field or a service like a contractor. And you do have people connecting to your infrastructure from in the field. You've always had to worry about that. Maybe you don't have any cyber skills, uh, you know, outside uh, inside your organization. So you have to depend on others. And that's one of the reasons we're talking to you today because TAS Networks can help you with that. They can be your cyber expert, your cyber um, go-to people, your trusted advisor. Maybe you don't have well thought out business continuity and disaster recovery plans. Those are extremely important. And note, those, those aren't necessarily technology. People think, you know, backup. But when I say the word plan, I'm actually talking about a written plan with steps of how you are going to respond. Like I live in Florida. We just went through a major hurricane. Um, maybe we're going to go through another one. I don't know. Hurricane season just started. But, you know, we have business continuity plans if you do business here in Florida because of that. And just like everything else, inflation hits um, the, the market of cybersecurity. It costs more now to respond and recover from an incident than it ever did before. Global legislation, there's privacy laws everywhere. And, you know, an interesting fact is, did you realize that those privacy laws apply to you if your client lives in California or your client lives in Europe? That's what uh, those questions have to do with. So you have to be knowledgeable about that. Again, a trusted advisor could help you navigate those waters. Cyber warfare. You know, look at the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. I mean, it definitely has had real world effects that we've seen in the news as far as cyber warfare and reputation damage. As a small business, it's much more difficult to recover from reputation damage than, you know, a large, we're, we're used to Target getting breached or Home Depot or whatever. Those are very large entities. They have very deep pockets, a very different ball game than where we're all at today. So I'd like to share some stats with you, if you don't mind. Oops. I didn't mean to do that, sorry. Um, so this is from Verizon. Most of you are probably familiar with Verizon. You know, Verizon Wireless used to be Verizon Fios, isn't Verizon anymore where I'm at. Um, but these are just a few stats. Um, and they put out this great report every year. And these are the four top ways that uh, you, they compromise your estate, your estate being your business, right? It's credentials, which they can harvest off the dark web phishing, which we'll talk about more in a little bit, exploit vulnerabilities. Um, I know we got a question prior to the webinar, 
And I'm wondering if that question is because of all the news around the Move It breach. Um, and so I think this would be a good place to address that. Or botnets, and those are just simply computers or AI agents <laughs> running around um, automating attacks. But the reason I want to talk about exploit vulnerabilities in this question is I'm sure um, most of you have heard about the Move It breach. It's one of the largest breaches ever. There was a vulnerability in that software that allowed bad actors um, to get into uh, people's data and break into their networks. And that was run by the Klopp gang. Couple interesting points about that is they are actually releasing that data now on the live internet, not in the dark web, which is that much harder to get to. And what uh, this person asked is, can you add any cybersecurity tips or advice on sending files back and forth to our colleagues? Anything special to be concerned with? So what I typically use is uh, we have, uh, and most people I think do have Office, have a Microsoft uh, Office subscription. And I use OneDrive a lot for sharing files externally. And internally, we use SharePoint. Uh, one thing I'm going to say about that is you should never click on a link, even if it's from a trusted source, because what if that trusted source was breached, right? And there's a bad actor and they're sending uh, email out. The What you should use as a test is were you expecting something from that trusted source? And if you weren't, it could be something bad. So you just reach out. Um, so yeah, I would be concerned with clicking any links in today's environment. Um, you know, it, whether they're on your computer or what we call smishing, when you get a bunch of those text messages, I would be very concerned about that. So I would use something like your Office 365, what it offers you, or if you use Google Docs, that also has something like that. There's reputable providers. I don't recommend any particular provider, but I've used Dropbox. Um, a bunch and that has worked well for me. Um, there's more complicated things you can do, um, but that's that's too long a conversation for here. Um, a new Angelina, ransomware. If I can just ask. Yeah, sure. Um, so, so you know, <clears throat> we talk about this in the enterprise right a lot, uh, mm -hmm. Verizon and so forth. I mean, mm -hmm. the SMB side. Uh, should everybody be concerned? from the SMB side or or you know sometimes the thinking is on oh, too small right it doesn't matter doesn't matter I think a lot of people don't realize and I'm going to go into some of the stuff that happens in the dark web actually that's my next slide so that's a good lead in um don't realize that these attackers are not sitting at their keyboards in their mom's basement right they are automating all of this stuff so they do what we call a prey and spray so as they automate, they're just knocking on doors. Which door can I get into? Um, the way I like to explain it is in my neighborhood, if a, a bad guy is looking for a home to break into and he's driving around and he tries my door and my door is locked, but then he goes next door to my neighbor's door, and my neighbor's door is unlocked. You know, that that is, you know, that's the path of least resistance. That's why we want something like we call defense in depth. We want multiple layers of defense because if I leave my door unlocked, even though I have an alarm, someone could still get in, right? Um, so, you know, yeah. Yeah, definitely as a small business, uh, you're actually targets now because they do uh, they do count on the fact that your door is unlocked, right? Yeah, you sound like my wife. Mul mul <laughs> multiple doors got to be locked, right? All the doors got to be <laughs> locked. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> the doors, the windows, you know. Everything. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> So, um, and one of the reasons too is because back in those good old days, I love to date myself, it's just fantastic, isn't it? Um, when I first started my career, um, and and not to date anyone on the call, but you probably remember this, Tavis, you used to have to be someone in your mom's basement hitting a keyboard, right? You used to have to be really smart. You had to understand networks. You had to be able to write software. Um, I mean, to be a bad guy, you really had to know what you were doing. That's just simply not the case anymore. Um, there's something we call ransomware as a service. And this is actually, the, it's number one is organized crime. And number two is a full enterprise. That means all I need is something called, remember I said the dark web's about that much harder to get to than the internet? All I need is to download a Tor browser that stands for the onion router, fire it up, 
connect to the dark web and I can buy anything my heart desires. And my heart doesn't desire most of the stuff out of there. So don't go there if you're faint of heart, right? But one of the things is, is these bad guys are thinking, oh my gosh, I'm making so much money doing this, you know? You know, why don't I make my services available to others? So that's exactly what they've done. You go there, You all you need is cryptocurrency, you buy this service, they give you YouTube videos, they have real help desks, they have payment processing centers, you just sit back and take a percentage of the proceeds. So super easy to be a bad guy, unfortunately, for us. And so you know, the AI other thing, isn't just for the good people, no. bad people are using it too, right? Yeah. yeah, they are. They are. And and actually that's that's changed a lot of stuff. And yeah, I mean, you know, you know, we used to tell people too that uh, very recently we used to tell people, you know, it could be a phishing email that has bad grammar or odd sentence structure, right? Uh guess what AI does? AI is so good at writing. So good. <laughs> So that's why the advice now is just don't click on anything. And if you're not expecting something from somebody, don't click on it, right? Yeah, for um, sure. Yeah. And unfortunately, um, and most of us, and this is my personal opinion, not not the stance of ConnectWise, um, you shouldn't pay a ransom. You're supporting terrorism. You buy stuff on the dark web. You're supporting terrorism, human trafficking, all kinds of bad, nasty stuff. And your odds of getting your stuff back are slim to none. Only six, 61% of the data is restored after paying a ransom. That's not great, right? Think about that. Do you get to choose which 61% you get back? Probably not. Um, and only 4% of companies in total get everything back. You know, these are these are bad guys. They're thieves. They're not interested in helping you out. Um, and... You know, it's more than a ransom. You know, this is the average approximate cost to organizations to fix the impacts of recent of, of ransomware attacks. It went down a little in 2022, but I don't think that's anything to yippee about because that's still in the millions. And that's the average approximate cost. OK. And the other question, which, uh, you know, I'm, I thought of and then I immediately went on, is that um, the question isn't, is my data interesting to bad guys? The question is, is your data important to you? What happens if that bad guy takes away your ability to use your data? How long can you stay in business? You know? Yeah, I, th so, and, and I yeah. think that's great, Natalie, to, to hear. Mm -hmm. And you got some things from Metro Detroit here, right? Mm -hmm. The Michigan area that's applicable to us. Uh, one of the things we preach at TAS Networks is backups, 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 and multiple layers of backups. So that mm -hmm. even if something you know, Offline. is ransomed or yeah, wherever it is, right? We we make sure that we just are checking that every day for our clients because it's so important mm -hmm. to keep their data and restore the data, right? Uh, backing up is half. The restoration okay. is the more important half, right? Yes. Can you restore your data? Exactly, exactly. And you know what? Um, again, defense in depth, the, another reason defense in depth is so important is um, because a lot of these um, tools, and we're not going into any tools today. So if you have questions about that, if you have something, post it. Um, otherwise, you can connect with TAS Networks later. But a lot of these tools can stop things like these in their tracks. Now, I'm not saying anything's ever 100%. You're never 100% protected because the bad guys only have to slip in one, one time. We have to get it right all the time. But a lot of these things can be prevented with that defense in depth. And I'm going to show you an attack where one of those defenses can be defeated. But if you have other defenses, they're going to catch it and they'll allow you to roll back. So maybe you don't even have to go and restore your entire backup, right? Because there's always time for that as well. You still may be without um, the ability to do business. So yeah, these are some local stories. If you ever want to make sure you get a Google hit, all you need to do is do cybersecurity news, blah, where blah is the place you live, <laughs> right? <laughs> So here you go. And you may be wondering, you know, why would I care about if Facebook gets breached? Facebook, I don't use in my business, or maybe you do. But you know what happens a lot of time? Another stat I want to throw out, 75% of breaches are due to human error. And one of those human errors is answering those quizzes on Facebook. Where was your... Who's your first boyfriend? What color was your first car? You know, um, you know, those those 
be careful when you're installing any of those apps, even those apps that ask to like morph your face or something that seems fun. Be careful and see what kind of data they're asking for permission to, or what kind of data you're giving up. Because what happens is like a large, Facebook has been breached more times than I can count, right? ChatGPT has been breached a couple, at least a couple of times. And what happens is a lot of people use the same username and password for their work as they do for their Facebook account or their Amazon account or their non-reputable Timu account or their Sheen account or all those are their, oh, don't even get me started on TikTok or their TikTok account. And then that gets breached or you've given it willfully to the bad guy. And then they try to use that information to break into your work. It's a proven fact. China is actually attacking businesses in the United States. And they run a bunch of those sites I just mentioned. And no, not Amazon and Facebook yet, um, but the other ones I mentioned. So be careful what you're giving away because think of the power of that. So you've got this chat bot, this AI that can write a really well-crafted phishing email. And how much better is that phishing email gonna be give, going to be when you're giving away personal information freely? Right. Thanks, so thanks Natalie. That. I appreciate that. I'm changing my password right now from 1985 Honda Accord, my first car. So thanks a lot. <laughs> appreciate that. Okay. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Glad I could be there for you. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Let's move on to this really great phishing attack that this is something that is available for sale on the dark web should you choose to purchase it. <laughs> There's two flavors that I've heard about in the news a lot recently, evil proxy and greatness. And the way this works, we call this an actor in the middle attack. And um, you have a user, user gets an email, says, hey, your Office 365 credentials have been compromised. So they're trying to go to office.com. That's the target website. Here we get, this is our actor in the middle. The actor in the middle uses something we call a proxy server. In super simple terms, all a proxy server does is take information from one server and passes it to another server. So we've got the proxy server that's run by the bad guy, the actor in the middle, right there in the middle by no accident, right? He set up a phishing website, which is office.com with too many Fs. But that doesn't even really matter in this scenario. So I want you to notice that it says everything is encrypted. We used to also tell people, another thing that's changed, that if your website said HTTPS, all your communication was encrypted, you were good to go. Do you know how long it takes me to set up an HTTPS website? that long. <laughs> and if I could do it, a bad guy can do it, right? So that HTTPS just means communications are encrypted. That's all it means, nothing else. User gets the email, user clicks on the email. What's the first thing the user did wrong here? <laughs> Any guessers? <laughs> Don't click anything, <laughs> okay? So if you get something saying your email has been compromised, your password has been compromised, <clears throat> go directly to the site. You know how to change your office password, or you should, or you can call your IT support. They could certainly tell you. So what happens here is the user goes, oh no, I just was in this webinar. She said, never click on anything, and I clicked on something. But he doesn't see that proxy. It happens so fast, he doesn't see it. <clears throat> he's not paying attention. He didn't mouse over the links in that email. And he ends up in the right place. So he thinks, whew, dodge that bullet. Not so much. <clears throat> so remember, everything's encrypted. This attacker, even though it's passing through his server, he could capture it if he wants. He could try to decrypt it, but he doesn't have to because then you'll see why in a moment. So the target site, which is office.com, prompts for your multi-factor authentication. That is something like an app on your phone, a hardware key, a text message that you get when you log into account that says, hey, put this code in too, like when you're doing your banking. And it goes. it also goes through the proxy server. The proxy server passes that back to the user. The user sees the prompt as normal, thinks everything's cool, puts in that code that was just texted to him, goes through the site, still encrypted, bad guy still can't see it. The phishing site forwards that to the target website. This is where it all goes wrong. It creates something we call the website office.com returns something called a session cookie. That session cookie, all you need to know about that is that everything that bad guy needs to be you. Game over. Nothing matters now. Now, if you have multiple layers of defense, if you had, number one, if you have security awareness training, 
Um, that That's a really great defense, not a technology, teaches people not to click on anything, right? Among other things, right? Uh, how to identify a suspicious email. And if your gut says it's suspicious, it probably is. Um, if you have endpoint detection and response, which unfortunately we don't have time to explain right now, um, if you did that and the bad guy gets in and starts launching scripts or you have a SIM or an intrusion detection or uh, in, <clears throat> intrusion detection, intrusion protection devices, they could see network traffic that shouldn't be happening or maybe what happens when these bad guys get into your emails, they may use it for data exfiltration. And when they do that, or they may sell a bunch of ransomware to all your nearest, dearest friends, right? That are in your address book. <clears throat> but what they'll do is they'll clean up their their trail very quickly with using rules in Outlook that unless you're looking at the exact right time, you're very unlikely to see it. But these technologies that I just mentioned are very likely to see it and they are very likely to set up an alert and, um, you know, warn you and be able to roll stuff back, which leads me to what is that minimum acceptable defense in depth? It's an incident response plan. Again, not a technology. Surprise, surprise. Right. This is a written plan. And it tells you what to do when something bad happens. Um, it tells you what to do if someone clicks on something they shouldn't have clicked on. Multi-factor authentication, which I just explained to you how it was defeated in that attack, but that's why we need defense in depth. Endpoint detection and response in its simplest terms, just think of that as what protects your workstation, your laptop. Security information and event management system, that think of that of what protects your infrastructure, your whole network, whether your network's in the cloud or your network is a physical network that collects information that could be used in conjunction with a security operations center. That's the M in MDR. That's endpoint detection with a security operations center. You need a security operations center for EDR and for SIM because they know what to do with those alerts and what they mean and what network traffic means. And you need business continuity disaster recovery. Just like Tavis said, backups are super important. They're just not the only part of that. You know, there's plans, written plans there as well. And then you need cybersecurity insurance. That is, that's here to stay, guys. Um, you need cybersecurity insurance. And I use guys as the general everyone term. And guess what? To get cyber insurance, you need all those things that I just showed you. So what is this people, process, and technology thing? Well, <clears throat> the people is things like security awareness training or security controls that prevent people from doing silly things. Uh, process is the how, <clears throat> how do you do stuff, right? Um, your incident response plan has a process. Your business continuity and disaster recovery plan has a process. And we all know what technology is. That's the cool stuff. But you can think of this as a three-legged stool. When you have a three-legged stool, if one of those legs is shorter or one of those legs is gone, uh, what happens? It falls over. And a really good way to explain what happens if you don't have all three of these, and I know everyone has heard of this. You guys are very quiet. You really should text me. You're making me sad. Um, is that, um, <clears throat> you know, this poor, Bob, I always pick it on Bob. So if your name is Bob, I apologize in advance. I do have a buddy, Bob, and I like to pick on him. So here we go. We're going to pick on Bob. So Bob gets an email again from Jen, the CEO. It says, Bob, I'm super busy. Do not bother me. Do not text me. Do not email. Do not call. I cannot talk to you. But one of our most important uh, supply chain vendors is way past due. We owe them 100K. They need it right now or, you know, just the world is going to end, right? Now, that is still the same, stayed the same. The sense of urgency and bad emails has stayed the same. And, um, oh, by the way, not only do they need 100K like yesterday, their ACH or their wire transfer and for the payment information has changed. And I need you to send that right away. Bob panics. Another good piece of advice. Calm down. Take a moment. Think. Think before you click. Think before you react. Bob wires 100K to a bad actor. I don't know why we call them actors. They're not acting. They're just bad guys, right? Um, and money's gone. So he sees the CEO later in the day and he goes, hey, I did exactly what you said. I sent that money. Are we good now? And she looks at him. She goes, what are you talking about? 
And the reason that happened is one, maybe Bob didn't have the correct training. He certainly didn't have a process which said, hey, um, we need to, if we're sending a certain amount to a vendor, um, we have a process, which means something like you have to talk to two executives or you have to talk to the CFO or, you know, some type of process that would slow him down so he would stop and think. We certainly had the technology, right? Because the money's gone, right? So that's an example most people can relate to. Natalie, you ever if I, if I like can that? break in. Yeah. So obviously this is great stuff. Uh, going back to that slide there, mm -hmm. uh, I think people think, okay, hey, TAS Networks or whoever can do everything, right? Can provide the tools, can provide everything. And when we talk to cybersecurity with folks, we have we, we say, Look, it is this three pronged stool, like you said, right? We can provide the technology, but if you don't have a process, uh, for instance, the ACH, right, that you mentioned, we've seen clients do that, right? Sadly to say, but a simple phone call would have fixed that with the process side and the people side, right? Um, we need help, right? The tools are only so good, but when you start providing things out there, a little observation, right? I mean, a lot of the folks on on or users on the line here um, showing that maybe they can mouse over and see is that a correct website or not, mm -hmm. uh, or looking in the bar up above your web browser to see, okay, that is not the way you spell Microsoft or not the way you spell, you know, mm -hmm. office.com. <laughs> Right. Uh, you know, even little things like that go so far in cybersecurity, just the awareness of understanding that. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Is that what a user can do to really help their oh, side yeah. of cybersecurity? Definitely. Just, you know, do those little things. Honestly, if something seems suspicious, because I know in some industries, you live and die by email and email attachments. I had a contractor in a course I just taught, and he was like, we get so many attachments and I said, unfortunately, you know, you're just going to have to do that training that if you're not expecting something from somebody that you don't click on it. And then, you know, but if you do have endpoint detection and response or that managed part, right, then if someone does click on something that should catch it. And most of the time it does catch it a, a great uh, I mean, in the 90 percent in the 90s, right, does catch that kind of stuff and stops it in its tracks. I mean, we're always going to have a new zero day. But the thing is, with endpoint detection and response, it does use AI for good, right? It does use machine learning for good. So it's looking at behavior. So if I click on a link in a document and I click on a PDF and that tries to launch a process to do something, the EDR is going to say, wait a minute, that that doesn't make sense. Why would a PDF or a PowerPoint or a Word doc, why would that launch a process um, <clears throat> outside of its, you know, its its area and it could stop stuff like that that's why those things are so important right yeah i think that's a that's a great thing to keep mm -hmm. in mind and i think that's great to remember back when we used to hold host our small business servers and had yeah. our own email that was a yeah. problem because we would mm -hmm. get all this spam mm -hmm. but the ai now for instance using microsoft 365 when we get an email, maybe we get one. Yeah. We don't, we rarely ever get two that look yeah. the same because it sees, hey, that's a spam. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. Let's block all the rest of it. You know, so it's got this computation from millions of emails going around that really help all of us. Oh, yeah. And people just need to slow down. Sometimes you get so busy, you're multi, I mean, I'm guilty of it. You're multitasking and, you know, you do you do something silly. And another good thing is you really need to have a culture of cybersecurity, right? And what I mean by that is a carrot always works better than a stick, right? If you like carrots, maybe honey, I don't know. But um, if someone clicks on something by accident, you should have the kind of environment where they can go and say, hey, I made a mistake. I clicked on something. That way you could stop it in its tracks and minimize damage. Now, if you have a serial clicker, you're going to have to do something about that, right? But, you know, they get everyone every once in a while, right? So just, you know, just got to stop and think. Excellent. And you know what? That 75% of, of it being caused by humans, that's actually good news. The year before that, it was 82%. So we are getting better. We are listening. <laughs> good. So we're patching our humans. <laughs> so we talked a lot about all these risks. What's our responsibility? 
<clears throat> well, we love to call this the data responsibility pie. Not sure it's a very yummy pie, but it is what it is, right? Notice it is a circle. It's a continuous circle. Nobody's pointing fingers at anybody else here. And what I'd like to start with is the data owner. That's you guys. And you actually own the liability for protecting your data. And the reason you do is not because we're not here to help you, because we're custodians and we are going to help you, but because you understand, you know your business objectives, which you've set, you know your risk tolerance, and TAS Networks is going to work with you to understand your business objectives and your risk tolerance and come up with a plan that works for you. And then you establish the budget for protecting your data, right? So... The IT team, which can be TADS, right, can implement those solutions, those technical solutions, and they are custodians of the data. But the cybersecurity team, also TAS, is going to help you understand that risk and explain to you how you can mitigate that risk. Because we know you can't, you know, you can't do, you can't, you have to eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? You cannot just eat the entire elephant in one bite. You have to start somewhere and, and, and get along that path. But we're all in this together, and I just want to make sure you understand that's why it's a circle. It's a continuous circle. And it really boils down to, like I said before, risk. It's what risk level are you willing to accept to protect your most valuable assets, those being your business? And hey, in your personal life, too. I mean, some of the things that you should do in business, you should do in your personal life. You should have a password manager. You should use multi-factor authentication everywhere you can. Um, you really have to use a password manager in these days, this day and age, because you should have a different username and password for everything you log into. And I'm not saying you shouldn't use single sign-on, where you use like a corporate email account to log into several things. That's actually a good thing. Um, but you should have so your Facebook account should not be the same username and password as your as your um, I don't know I don't I can't think of it your Amazon account for instance. And goodness sakes, it should not be the same as the, what you use for business, right? But you should protect yourself personally as well. I think banking is a big one too, right? I, I mean, mm -hmm. that's been a golden rule. I've told everybody have something totally different that for banking. You, you know, you you mm -hmm. do not want people to guess mm -hmm. a banking password. Your banking, your crypto wallet, your your retirement. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the just to. You know, that reminds me about uh, the last patch breach It's the breach that just keeps on giving. Right. That's a bad example of a password manager because they did not use very strong encryption and they ha handled the incident terribly. But people, their vaults are starting to be decrypted. So if you had last pass, please use something else and please change every single last one of your passwords, because we're now seeing theft of crypto wallets due to people not changing their last pass passwords. So, you know, what are these guys talking about? If someone could just translate all of the cybersecurity uh, nonsense, um, you know, that would be awesome. So I just saw something pop out in, in uh, chat and you're giving me heart palpitations. Absolutely not. The worst absolute place you could save your passwords is in any web browser. That is a horrible idea. That is so easy to crack. A kindergartner could do it. Um, password manager, not web browser. Now, the password, the, the vault that Apple offers is better than nothing, um, but it only works for Apple products. It doesn't work for everything. Um, a typical password manager for, for your family, I'm not talking business now, I'm talking family, is about 65 US dollars a year. And I would bet that you spend more than that on whatever hobby or whatever coffee or eating out. I mean, one meal out these days is $65, right? Uh, so I think it's a bargain. Uh, yeah, but the, oh, please do not store passwords in your browser. If you have, get them out of there and please change them because I'm sure you've already been breached. They may yeah, have I done that's anything. A, that's a good point, yet. Natalie. Yeah. I, I use Dashlane. Mm -hmm. Dashlane mm -hmm. uh, for personal, has a personal, <clears throat> but it also has a family one. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing is, too, as, as I get older, I think of, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay, everything's something. in this. You worry about others. If something were to happen to me, mm -hmm. there's an option in these password managers for those that would survive you, mm -hmm. uh, thinking of a legacy plan, 
right, as well for those of us maybe that are business owners or have things, just anybody in general, right, mm -hmm. where you can have them get that. You give them assignment through the family uh, plan. So it's really a, a great way. And that way you don't have to write everything out or, uh, mm -hmm. God forbid, give it to a lawyer or something. Oh, you know? God. So, you can know, you imagine? Sorry yeah. to any lawyers on the phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We just... You know, Apologies. you don't know where it would be, right? Some piece of paper right. floating out there. So, mm -hmm. yeah, like stuck to your keyboard or stuck to your laptop, right by your little trackpad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I don't do that either. Um, <clears throat> so, um, you know, personally and professionally, one of the best things you could do is a password manager and multi-factor authentication. Both, uh, it works for both. Um, so how do we translate what we need as far as cybersecurity into terms that anyone can understand? Well, I'm sure most of you can relate to this picture. This is a home. Your home may be a condo, maybe an apartment, maybe a single family home, a duplex, whatever. But I would venture to guess most of you have a home, right? So how do we get to the right cybersecurity? How do we know what to defend. So I really, you know, this is interactive. I really should have hidden this stuff to make you interact with me. But first thing you have to do is identify what you have, right? So when I usually ask people to identify, they'll usually say family or pets is usually one of the first ones. <laughs> it's funny, it's funny how often it's pets and not family. Uh, <laughs> collectibles, like my Lego behind me. Um, <clears throat> documents and valuables, your passport, marriage certificate, birth certificates, your electronics and computers. And then actually there's kind of a subcategory here. You need to categorize what you have, right? Because I don't know about you, but if the TV I bought two weeks ago gets stolen, I'm going to be super sad. But when I claim that with my insurance, I'm going to get a much better TV because they've stopped making that one they made two weeks ago, right? But if my computer gets stolen, that's another story, right? Um, because that has links to my financial data, maybe my business data. And you really should keep business and personal as separate as possible as well to protect yourself and your business. What do you do to protect the things you've identified and categorized? So in your home, you have doors and windows. You'll lock them. You got that, Tavis? Lock them. <laughs> okay. I'll, okay. I'll keep in mind. Okay. Education. Um, if you have teenagers at home, you should be ed educating them on, on safety, right? You know, <clears throat> you know, like who should they friend in Facebook? Because we don't, nobody knocks on our doors anymore, right? I mean, who should they, what should they post? Who should they friend? You know, yard signs. We love those yard signs. I think I may have one in the yard protected by guardian, simply safe ring. Who's, oh, by the way, also been breached multiple times. Um, then if someone gets past our defenses, how do we detect? We may actually have the alarm that goes with that uh, sign. May have motion sensors, doorbell camera, again, ring. <laughs> Neighborhood watch. I like to call this my nosy neighbors, right? And then once we detect, how do we respond? Well, we may have a dog in the home that attacks, right? We may decide that it's too dangerous and run away. Um, we may call the authorities. We may bring out our handy trendy, handy dandy baseball bat. And I'd then, like to see that one. Yeah, the handy dandy <laughs> baseball bat. Yeah, I'd probably miss and hit myself. Um, <laughs> and then I'd probably flee. Um, how do we recover when something has happened? This is when you pull out that cyber incident response plan. This is when you rely on those backups or that business continuity and disaster recovery plan. This is when you call your liability insurance or your cyber insurance or your homeowner's insurance. And it may even involve emergency equipment because what if a hurricane comes through a tornado? I'm not sure what natural disasters do you guys get to enjoy out there? Mainly, you know, we have flooding and tornadoes, um, but the problem is, is that Michigan has a false sense of security, right? It is one of the safest places in yeah. the union. Uh, yeah. But I think when we talk to people, oh, the disaster never happened. One of the things that people never think of is a mm. fire. A oh, fire yeah. has destroyed our clients' information, mm -hmm. and that is a big disaster in a big way yes. that uh, can happen at any moment in time, frankly. Yeah. And you know what? While you guys were, weren't were paying attention, I just taught you a cybersecurity framework. That's how I translated it for you. This is actually uh, the NIST framework. And most cybersecurity frameworks can be broken down into identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And that's the same way you think about that personally with your home is the way you could think about cybersecurity. And this is the right cybersecurity. And what does that contain? It contains these components, right? 
And how do you know which of these components you need? Well, TAS Networks, Trusted Advisor, they understand your business objectives. They understand your risk tolerance. They're going to discuss it with you. And they're going to do a security assessment. They are going to line by line across people, process, and technology, figure out what you're doing and create a roadmap and a journey for you. And another question I get asked a lot, so I'm just going to ask it, is when did this end? Does this end? So once I get those things that you showed me, am I done? Well, unfortunately, um, bad guys are always doing new things. Um, so us good guys, we got to do new things too. There's other concepts. I could have just like, you know, made your head explode here, but I'm not here to make your head explode. What I am here to tell you is, so when I started my career back as a software developer, I used to have a boss that always would used to say, perfect is the enemy of done. Because if you know any software developers, we have a few screws loose. There's something wrong with all of us. And we like to compete. And what we would do is we'd have a requirement from the customer say, hey, we need to access this piece of data, say within 30 seconds and process it within another 30 seconds. So we'd get that done and then someone would go, maybe me, allegedly. Um, I bet you I could do that in 20. And then someone else, I bet you I could do that at 15. My boss would go, time out, guys. Perfect is the enemy of done. Let's get it done to the requirements first. Once we get it done to the requirements, if you want to make it faster, better, make a better sports car, you go for it. And so I looked that up and it's actually a Voltaire quote, which means I'm really smart because this is a philosopher quote. The perfect is the enemy of the good. And all that means is I know I just threw so much information at you and it can be very overwhelming. And that's why you do need a trusted advisor. And the most important thing I could tell you is just start somewhere, do something, start, work with a trusted advisor, get a plan going and just just work on that journey. And as things change in the cyber landscape, you know, let them let them be the people who bear the brunt of that, who understand what's going on and explain it to you in terms you can understand. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to my new friend, Tavis. And thank you so much for your time, everyone. Thanks a lot, Natalie. We really appreciate it. If you have any questions uh, that have come up, go ahead and put them in the, the Q&A. We're happy to do that now. Uh, you know, we've talked a lot about acronyms. We've talked a lot of different things here, right? IT has a ton of acronyms. And so keep that in mind that you don't have to know everything. You just start with something. Uh, we're happy to help out uh, with a security risk audit to take a look at these things, see where we can help in certain technologies peoples and processes are, are all together. It's really a combination of things that, that we can help out with. We use uh, some ConnectWise security products in the background to really help us as well. And so you see our contact information there to, to help out. But please, by all means, we're, we're happy to help. Uh, I, I tell my folks now, you know, we're happy that uh, we, we started the company 20 years ago this year. And uh, so it's uh, hard to believe, you know, starting the company myself uh, with my wife, but we have become more of a security company than I ever imagined 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, hey, I started a company to fix and, and help folks with their networks, right? But uh, we are more of a security company. We preach it every day. Everything that we do uh, is in the cloud. And so we have multi-factor authentication as a company for everything that we do to, to be secure, but we're here uh, to help you out as well and, and uh, definitely continue on. So a uh, question here, Natalie, maybe asks, uh, you know, what apps do you recommend for saving passwords? Uh, I use LastPass, but, but are there any ones out there that you recommend? Um, I use or not I LastPass. Did I say LastPass? You did. I'm sorry. I I had your LastPass problem on the brain. Dashlane is what I use. I okay. use Dashlane. I'm sorry. That's okay. I personally use One Password. Um, there's a lot of good ones out there. Uh, what you want to look at is you want to make sure um, that they're using a modern um, crypt. Uh, cryptographic algorithm to encrypt and there have multiple layers of encryption and actually there's a very good um, 
<clears throat> there is a really, really good webinar, if I do say so myself, on the ConnectWise website that I did with my friend and colleague, uh, Bryson Medlock, who's extremely brilliant. He, exp he explains what you should look for in a password manager. I mean, I don't personally recommend one, but that's what I choose to use is one password. Um, I saw we had another couple of questions come in. <clears throat> yeah, sure. And maybe so can, Aubrey, I'll, we can uh, get that yeah. link uh, to that webinar out to our folks that are online yeah. today too. Yeah, I could provide that to you. Uh, so can Outlook notify me if a new device signed into my account? Um, it depends how you have your email configured. I know that I get notified. I, I'm pretty sure you can, but um, I think it depends on how you have it configured. But I know that uh, SIM and EDR, they can detect stuff like that. And yes, you definitely can turn on multi-factor authentication for your Outlook email, definitely. And you should, and your Google email and every other email you have. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Mindy, for that question. That's our. That's really what we recommend now uh, mm -hmm. is that MFA, the multi-factor authentication, if you didn't understand mm -hmm. what that te technology means. Yeah. Uh, and we use, whether it be Microsoft Authenticator, which is mm -hmm. typically what you want to use, it's a free item. Uh, you just have to turn it on the corporate wide uh, mm -hmm. item. Now, the, the problem we hear is, oh, it's another step, right? But I think Natalie has shown us today how important it yeah, is, very, right? Very uh, very you know, you may have a salesperson, hate to pick on them, right? But they, they're like, oh, I hate this, right? Mm -hmm. Because I got to re-sign in. Well, the multi-factor authentication with Outlook's a little different. You don't have to do it every time you access Outlook, right. uh, which is nice. But mm -hmm. it, like, uh, like was mentioned, a, a new device, right, or something. You have to have that MFA. So very much something that uh, is is a hundred percent recommended from us. Yeah. So my Google does notify me even with my MFA turned on if it's coming from a new location. Um, my Outlook, however, if you configure your Outlook with MFA, it, you're going to know if someone tries to log in with your credentials because you're going to get prompted for that multi-factor authentication code. And there is a real thing called a multi-factor authentication fatigue where a bad guy does somehow get your user, your credentials and will keep prompting you. So um, and sometimes people get tired of the prompts and finally just say yes. You're just going to, what I would do is ignore them and change your password because if you change your password guess what you're not going to get prompted anymore do not whatever you do say yes <laughs> yeah yeah and i think we're seeing a lot of the good websites that are taking security seriously for instance yes. amazon uh they will tell you hey there's a new login attempt mm -hmm. from madison heights michigan is this you uh, ignore is fine, but we're letting you know. Don't ignore those emails, right? Mm -hmm. But if, mm -hmm. if you got one of those and you didn't do it, go change your password, right? Yeah. Make sure you take the initiative to to go do that. The nice thing with multi-factor authentication with the Google or with the Microsoft Authenticator is it prompts you, right? Approve sign in. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, if that wasn't you, Don't we got a problem, it. right? Don't yeah. approve it. And now is the time to go change that password. Right. And these some of these technologies that we're telling you about can actually be configured to alert you. Like we do something called unexpected travel, for instance. So if I log in from Florida and then someone tries to log in for my account from Italy, that is, uh, no, excuse me, un, not unexpected, but impossible, impossible travel. Um, you know, you could set up alerts that say, hey, it, it's very easy to set up alert that says, hey, uh, that's not possible because it's not possible for me to get to Italy in five minutes because I don't have a teleporter from Florida. I wish it was, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, I just got an, uh, a message. Uh, my son, Zach, is on the line. He's one of our good field consultants. He said that alert policies and defender policies can also be created to alert users of every sign in. So he checked that and, and definitely that is something that we can enable in your organization if you'd like to see that. Yeah. OK, great. Thank you. OK, so I've gotten fishy emails of the sign in notifications. The goal being to click on the change your password link, which is fake. That's right. That's why those are very common. And that's exactly how that attack that I just demonstrated. That's you. Well, that's usually how it happens. Um, and 
I mean, it can happen other ways, but that's why it's so important not to click on those links. Because if you get something saying your Amazon account has been compromised, go to Amazon, change a password. Worst case scenario, you spent five minutes changing your password, you know. But if you click on that link, the worst case scenario can be a lot worse. Exactly. Always go to the source. You have the source. You probably have it bookmarked. Right? Probably. <laughs> or you might. I have them all up here, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Yeah. But you know what? Another good thing is if you use a password manager, your password manager can launch those sites for you and help you change your passwords. That's a good point. Very yeah. good point. And they'll alert you too. I know mm -hmm. one of the things with Dashlane is say, hey, they'll they'll check the dark web for you mm -hmm. automatically and alert you to the fact that 12 of your passwords are compromised. Go change them. Mm -hmm. uh, not an easy thing to do, especially if you use the same one for 18 sites. Um, but uh, that's something that shows you right away. And, and the and I think one of the things that we've seen, Natalie, too, is these breaches, no one is immune, right? No I mean, we talk about mm -hmm. the big ones, but there are littler ones, and even huge organizations have littler ones that get breaches all the time. Uh, Twitter, now X, had it, mm -hmm. right? And that's where maybe it'll tell you this breach is known and this password was used and maybe you have a variant of that password. Everybody loves to put at one or number sign one and then change it to number sign two and then number sign three. Not a good uh, practice. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So keep keep those things in mind. Yeah, very true. Well, I think that's all of our questions that we have out there. So thank you so much, Natalie, for joining us today. Thanks everybody for being on the line today. Again, if you need help with us, contact us, let us know. Uh, we're definitely here to help. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their day. Take care. Definitely. Thanks a lot. Bye.